you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, and, and on behalf of the Collective, I'd like to thank the organisers for having us participate, not just today, but yesterday and the day before. The, um, the room's gotten a little bigger today since, uh, since we spoke yesterday, so um, I'll share with you probably a little bit more of, of what um, as Claudia uh, spoke about before, and, and I'll also touch and I'll take a little poetic license and, and talk about New Zealand because uh, Elizabeth didn't manage to cover HPV DNA testing as part of the, the surgical cancer um, screening program that they've implemented there, but it does play a significant role there as well. So, cervical cancer testing um, is definitely fast growing and, and it's also evolving very quickly. Global guidelines are changing um, and we see in certain areas more aggressive screening and in some areas less aggressive screening. So, for instance, in the US they have aggressively adopted HPV DNA testing to triage women and they are looking at using it um, as a screening tool in females over 30. Um, it's a little bit different in the UK uh, and it's different again here in, in Asia Pacific. So um, globally there, there does seem to be significant differences uh, country to country. Um, there is certainly a trend towards the development and use of biomarkers as well. Um, there has been a, a realisation that uh, there's an importance in being able to develop prognostic tools that can efficiently predict disease and disease progression. So HPV DNA can, can actually tell you whether papillomavirus is, is present in a sample, but some of the other markers that are now being looked at are also able to, to help to predict those patients that are likely to progress to um, more significant disease. Um, it was interesting the last couple of days to, to hear about a lot of the Malaysian statistics. So I think one of the areas where, where DNA testing might be able to help, and not just DNA testing, but molecular testing, because um, GenProbe assay is an mRNA test, but it also is a very proof, um, is, is in this statistic here. So uh, you've got, in the data that I have, Last time, uh, 2007, nearly 1,500 cases of cervical cancer and nearly 800 deaths. So the incidence rate and the mortality rates are still quite high. And this is really evidence in uh, data that we've, we've managed to get from the WHO where there is a significant difference in both the incidence and the mortality rates in developed countries and in developing countries. And the main reasons for the higher incidence um, in developing countries tend to be lack of awareness, which is something that's been brought up here um, by several speakers, um, and lack of screening, access to, to technologies, um, and limited access to, to healthcare services in general. So I think if we're able to incorporate um, an element of HPV testing into triaging ASCIS patients at least, hopefully the, the incidence and certainly the mortality rates can, can see significant decline in the coming years. So just a little bit about HPV. Um, this was also covered, but HPV infections are very common. Most are asymptomatic, and the vast majority of them regress. Persistent infections with high-risk HPV types tend to cause abnormalities, and these are the ones that tend to develop into cancer. But that cancer is usually very slow growing and can take 10 years or more to manifest itself. Um, I think one of the, the earlier speakers made this point, and I think it's, it's very salient, that among all the malignant tumours, cervical cancer is the one that can be most effectively controlled by screening. So there is an opportunity with a good screening program to vastly reduce the incidence and the mortality associated with cervical screening. And, and I think Professor Collier showed some really great data on, on the experience in Slovenia where they've managed to halve the mortality rate in a very short space of time. I think one of the things that has changed in the, in the last four to five years is the advent of better tests through the, the use of PCR and through the use of real-time PCR technologies. Um, what Elizabeth didn't mention was that in New Zealand, the, the six or seven labs that um, perform cytological screening for, for um, pap smears also must have access to HPV DNA testing and 
I think the vast majority of those labs are standardised on real-time PCR. Some using Roche and some using Apple. So uh, the two, in that context at least, go hand in hand, and the labs have to have proficiency in cytological screening and also access to and proficiency in, in HPV DNA testing. Um, and it's a key element of, of the uh, sort of cervical cancer um, screening program. So, in general, this is, is a, a typical um, flowchart of prevention and patient management in, in HPV as, as it stands at the moment. Malaysia is one of the countries that has introduced the HPV vaccine and it has been given to um, young ladies, uh, 11, 12, 13 years old. Um, and so I think, as Stuart mentioned, in, in the, the next decade or the decade after that, we should hopefully see uh, a drop in the incidence of, of HPV-related um, cervical cancer. But that does require that um, the take-up of, of the vaccine is high and the coverage is high, and that's not necessarily always the case. So um, we will still need to be able to, to test for um, cytological screening and, and for DNA testing because there will be um, opportunities missed by the vaccine. Um, then we head to, to pap smear. Um, we use cytology, whether that's liquid-based cytology or, or standard um, cytology. Most of those patients uh, tend to be normal, but 5% uh, of their amounts uh, tend to be acid. Now, interestingly, in the data that was shown here the other day, I think of the abnormal patient, or the abnormal pap smears that, that uh, collected every year, I think 40% of those were ASCUS. So I think that's uh, a high number and it, again, lends itself to the opportunity to potentially triage those patients with another test to actually determine whether those patients need to be sent on for colposcopy or be, be put back into the system and just be monitored a little more regularly. HPV testing comes in um, in the US uh, for women greater than 30 years old. Um, that really improves the negative predictive value of the, the testing combination. So if you have a negative pap scan uh, or a negative liquid-based cytology scan and a negative HPV test, you are 99% likely not to, to have uh, infection. There is a lower positive predictive value, and this is one of the reasons why biomarkers are also being looked at. Um, the thought is that biomarkers do have the potential to improve the positive predictive value of the testing in combination with uh, perhaps being an HPV testing. And then colposcopy tends to, uh, continues to be the gold standard. So a snapshot of overall the, the number of tests and, and the amount of testing that's done. Um, without question, um, pap smear is still far and away the, the largest um, test that, that's used for both screening and diagnosis. There is still more conventional pap smear uh, testing being done than liquid-based cytology, but um, the liquid-based cytology is becoming more and more popular. As mentioned, visual inspection either with acetic acid or glucose iodine is an option. Um, HPV DNA testing is available. Uh, Kyogen is the hybrid capture assay. Roche with its 4800, Hologic with the, the, um, their assay. And our Abbott assay is also an mRNA assay that's available through um, Genpro. And then cellular tests um, using immunized chemistry or in situ hybridization techniques, looking at, at markers like E67 and oncogenic precursors like E6 and E7. So in addition to um, HPV DNA testing, we also have a, a fish-based assay, which is in combination uh, a number of different markers that can help to predict um, HPV uh, sorry, cervical cancer um, likelihood to progression. And part of the, the process that we went through involved some market research, which I thought I'd, I'd share with you. The market research was conducted in the US, so this is, is much more US-centric, but um, as you can see here, screening generally is thought to be used. Um, Liquid-based cytology now can, is considered the gold standard, um, and it is appreciated for its simplicity, its speed, and its non-invasiveness. 
The criticism is the high level of false positives. That's the same criticism for, for conventional pap smears as it is for the based psychology. And, and the thought is that that leads to unnecessary invasive management, um, which is colposcopy as a general rule. And, and it's considered invasive, so wherever possible, we, we try to avoid invasive procedures. Um, HPV DNA testing is not routinely added to pap screening in Europe, but it is now being routinely added to, to pap screening in the USA. Um, outside of the US, testing for HPV status is primarily confined to ASCUS and or borderline cases, and it's rarely considered for ELSA. Um, triage of ASCUS is mainly using HPV testing um, in addition to more frequent PAP. So why did we go ahead and, and develop a new test for, for um, HPV? Well, as mentioned, with technology moving on, um, the ability to, to use real-time PCR and to be able to uh, genotype HPV as well as just detect it is now affordable to us. And one of the statistics that um, is widely known is, is HPV 16 and 18 tend to be the more aggressive uh, genotypes, and then two genotypes that, that tend to, lead, uh, to result in, in more aggressive uh, progression to, to cervical cancer. So, um, real time PCR affords you the ability to look at multiple fluorophores, and you have the ability to, to stratify um, HPV by, by type, not by all types, but by, by subtype, especially for 16 and 18. So, um, the assay that, that we have developed, and, and it's a very similar assay to what Roche has developed, is an assay that's a qualitative assay for detection of DNA from 14 high-risk types. And, and Mario didn't cover this today, but, but yesterday it came up that 14 might not be the, the correct number for um, high-risk types eventually with question marks about the oncogenicity of, of 66 and 68. But at this point, genotype 16, 18, and then um, the rest of the genotypes are covered, and we use. Oops, my slides are wrong. I apologise. We use different colours to detect different um, subtypes. So we have a specific fluorophore for the detection of HPV 16. We have a specific fluorophore for the detection of HPV 18, and then we have a separate um, fluorophore which is, is detecting all of the other iris types. How this works and, and what the significance of 16 and 18 detection are is still up for debate, but um, the thought at the moment certainly is that if you are psychologically normal, but you have um, HPV 16 or 18 detected, then those patients tend to be directed straight to colposcopy. For those patients that have one of the other high-risk types, they tend to be referred back into the um, normal population and monitored a little more regularly, but they don't get sent to colposcopy. So hopefully we're, we're saving some cost and some invasive procedures by being able to stratify patients. Um, one of the things that, that came out of some of the talks uh, over the last couple of days is, is the attempt to try to get more um, women to, to take um, pap smears or, or to, to get tested. Um, our assay works with either the SurePath or the, the Thune Prep LBC. So if you've had a liquid based cytology uh, specimen taken, you can actually take the remnants of that and run an HPV DNA test with the same product. So you don't have to go back and resample. For those patients that have a conventional pap smear, we have a third option, which is a, a surgical brush. Uh, and this brush can be used when there isn't a liquid based cytology test available. One of the, the things that we're interested in looking at is also whether or not this can be something that can be used as a home collection device, because that might be a way to get uh, more women to, to actually enroll or, or send back samples and, and hopefully increase the uptake of, of testing. We target uh, the L1 region um, with a modified GP5 and GP6 uh, primer set that was first identified in Holland. We amplify up a, a sequence of about 150 base pairs, and in the literature, the L1 region is the most conserved region of the HPV genome, and it's also the best region for typing and subtyping. So that's the reason we've chosen 
that. One of the, the advantages of building our PCR office is uh, the ability to automate. Um, and so when we start to talk about screening, we start to talk about large scale testing, um, automation becomes critical. Uh, automation also lends itself to, to centralising testing in, in certain places, and that's the example that's happened in New Zealand, where only a small number of labs test 450 or 500 thousand patients worth of, of pap smears and then the follow on extra DNA. So um, automation also uh, enables um, hopefully a more rapid turnaround, uh, a little more um, standardised testing as well and, and the, the requirement for uh, expertise as great because the machines do most of the work. Um, one of the nice things about our system is that we've got the ability to run many other tests on it as well, so for those people interested in sexually transmitted infections, the committee of on it um, for drug and runners, for, for other STIs, and you can also use the same platform, so multiple tests on the, the one instrument. I think as mentioned, guidelines for screening change and, and are different uh, country to country, so uh, in the EU we see differences from country to country. And in the US, the guidelines differ to, to that of the EU, where by HAP or HPV DNA uh, is run as a screening test if the, the female is over 30 years old. Um, for those who run a HAP that's equivocal, they then go on to HPV DNA and then eventually on to colposcopy uh, in the EU. HAP is the first choice if uh, the HAP skin is abnormal then reflex to HPV testing and then onto colposcopy. I mentioned biomarkers before. Um, biomarkers and their use is really in its infancy, but it's something that is gaining a lot of momentum. Uh, the, the main biomarkers that are of interest are, tend to be P16, P67 and, and two oncogenic variants, P6 and E7. And really the interest in biomarkers is because there's a requirement for more specific markers to improve the positive predictive value of a positive test. Um, as mentioned, these are in their infancy and, and studies will need to be done to um, assess their value before they move into clinical practice, but this is an, an area that is being worked on considerably at the moment. So just in summary, I think HPV DNA testing um, does offer up the opportunity for improvements in uh, detection and management of uh, abnormal pap smears uh, in triage, in the first instance the diagnosis, and then eventually I think as a screening tool um, it does lend itself to uh, automation, it does lend itself to, to quicker turnaround times, to, to better sensitivity and to, to greater specificity, um, and those sensitivities and specificities can hopefully be enhanced with the biomarkers in years to come. Uh, so that's my last slide, and I'd like to thank everyone for their attention. Our next speaker is the Mr. Uh, Glenn Costi. He's the initial assistant business director for the EU and uh, the cancer. Uh, Mr. Glenn Costi flew all the way from uh, North Carolina to Wales. He's the uh, member of the Australian Society of Microbiology and also a member of the Australian Society of Psychology. He has uh, more than 10 years experience in patient history, diagnostic markets in psychology and more uh, uh, He also published studies in the uh, cost effective of vaccine in Taiwan. So, if you would like to call him on the uh, Mr. Glenn Costi. My name is Glenn Costin, I'm from BD Diagnostics uh, and based in Sydney, Australia. I know I stand between lunch 
so I'll try and uh, make this as enjoyable as possible and very informative. And what I'd like to start with, for those who weren't with us the last few days, is just a quick overview of the short path liquid-based test. Uh, so the short path liquid-based test comprises of three main components. Uh, it's a liquid-based PAP test. Uh, it's FDA approved, like FinPrep, as Stuart mentioned earlier. The two tests are the only two FDA approved liquid-based technologies on the market today and are extensively used in countries like the US, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, uh, especially where they have uh, advanced screening programs in place and uh, high participation levels. In Malaysia, I, I believe now, after we launched around two years ago with a direct local operation for BD, uh, we now supply more LBC in Malaysia than any other test. Uh, we have about 70% of the New Zealand market and more tests are supplied into Singapore and other markets of Asia Pacific. Um, the BIOS are transferred to a Prestain slide processor, which is a high throughput system that's capable The last component, the BD focal point imaging system, uh, it's very successfully used in the US where it was FDA approved in 2008 for the guided screening component. Uh, we have in New Zealand, um, it's the, the majority, uh, or the most number of imaging systems in New Zealand are the short path uh, system combined with the focal point imager. Uh, I think across ANZ now we have about 12 and that's moving to something like 17 by the end of this year. Uh, we've just installed the first system in N Health in Thailand, Bangkok, uh, where they're using the system for both conventional pap smears and short pap samples. And this is something I want to talk about in a little bit more detail. Uh, we also have systems in Hong Kong, Korea, Japan, globally over 500 platforms are installed. I don't want to touch on today, uh, for those who were here you know, yesterday and the day before, we looked at a lot of the, the data on the short path technology. Um, I presented data from the, the New Zealand government statistics from 2009 for the laboratories and statistics from the UK screening program specifically for England and Wales, which showed significant performance in the short path product in comparison to other LBCs, particularly in detection rates but also unsatisfactory levels. Uh, in New Zealand, for example, uh, the average unsatisfactory with short path is around 0.3, 0.4% in, in the laboratories that use our product um, from the 2009 statistics and, and the competitor we see is around 4.4% which would actually be higher than the current 2.5% guideline now set in Malaysia. It was always interesting in the last few days to hear about the challenges and the opportunities for improvement in the, the local screening program and you know, I'm very proud that I live in a country that has a very well organised screening program uh, that still utilises the conventional pap smear. And as Stuart correctly pointed out, for decades this test has been very successful and has reduced cervical cancer rates and deaths in many countries around the world. And in Australia still continues to use the conventional pap smear. It's the only test reimbursed by the government. The Australian government does not reimburse liquid base, it does not reimburse HPV triage, uh, it does for test of cure, uh, but certainly uh, having one of the lowest cervical cancer rates in the world, probably after Finland, uh, Australia is very similar with a population based in Malaysia, the conventional smear is successful, there's no doubt about that. Screening accuracy, turnaround times, asbestos reduction levels, cost, shortage of screener staff, training and, and, and more importantly participation levels uh, is something that probably needs to increase in Malaysia regardless of which screening method you use. Uh, and I want to look at these opportunities for improvement and offer the Ministry but also the screening program a, a potential cost-effective and realistic solution. Okay, so what are the options? Um, you obviously can continue with the conventional PAP that you do today. Uh, you can move to liquid-based um, PAP testing. Um, with either of the two FDA approved products today that we've discussed. Um, you could combine those with imaging. Uh, you could do like New Zealand uh, LBC PAP with imaging and HPV triage. This is probably the most you know, ideal screening situation or scenario, but it, it's expensive. And I want to talk about some of the costs. 
HPV primary screening is something, as mentioned by Tom, something that may happen in the next decade or so moving forward, uh, particularly as the quality of the HPV tests uh, improve. Uh, they're probably not at the level where they're acceptable for primary screening today across the whole population group. <coughs> uh, and then this, the last option is conventional PAP. What you've got today, but improving it with the imaging technology from BD. Um, the BD focal point, as I mentioned, can, can screen successfully and quite accurately conventional slides and or liquid-based short path specimens. So it gives the laboratory and the screening program uh, a lot of choice. So have a look at the uh, estimated cost for what you do, you're doing in Malaysia today, particularly in the ministry. If the program does screen around 450,000 samples, if you look at what it costs to prepare those slides, screen those slides, transport them to the lab, I, I think a fair estimate would be about $4 US or 12 Malaysian ringgit per sample. Okay, it may be a little bit lower, it may be a little bit higher, but certainly on the, um, the formulas that we use internally at BD, and knowing a little bit about the Malaysian screening program, uh, I think this is a realistic uh, number. It doesn't include all the costs after the results are provided to the clinician. So the treatment costs, it doesn't include education, it doesn't include vaccination, or anything else that may consist in the program. This is purely collection of sample, screening in the laboratory, and providing the result. In comparison, the liquid-based sample, for 450,000 samples, in most major markets, would cost around $5 million. Okay. Um, and that's using the screening cost for Malaysia. So knowing what the liquid base costs are for the test, knowing what the screening costs are in Malaysia, uh, you'd be looking at a significant cost increase to use liquid based cytology. Uh, again, this is something the Australian government does not accept. They will not pay for liquid based cytology. Um, you know, we're quite open and honestly that. Hologic and BD have submitted over the last 10 years various applications to the Australian government. All of them have been refused on liquid base due to the success of the conventional pap smear in terms of its cost effectiveness to the taxpayer. Liquid based cytology with imaging would be another option. Uh, this would increase to around $7 million plus uh, based on the estimates that I would use. So it's a significant jump from the, the current cost of around 1.8 million, uh, probably about three times the level in terms of cost per result. But would certainly provide greater accuracy, improved turnaround times, reduction in ASCUS, I think there's no doubt about that. Um, but it does come with a cost, and that's something that the ministry and people involved in the screening program you know, need to uh, assess and, 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 and measure whether it is um, going to provide a a cost benefit to the women of Malaysia. Okay, now we see pap with triage with HPV, uh, something that the New Zealand government undertakes. Um, if this was to be rolled out in Malaysia, you know, 450,000 samples for the liquid base, um, the triage ratio you'd use for HPV testing would probably take the average reportable to around 20 plus dollars. This would be over $9 million per annum in Malaysia, so it's about five times almost the screening program cost today. Okay, and this also assumes that you have the laboratory established to do the molecular testing. This doesn't include um, laboratory facilities, training costs, implementation costs, and that's why I've used the $9 million plus, because I think that's conservative. I think you couldn't actually do it for $9 million, it would be over $9 million. Okay, HPV primary screening, uh, molecular testing, as we all know, can be very expensive. Uh, this would increase to around $18 million plus. Okay, when you use HPV as a primary screen, obviously you have triage, uh, and again, doesn't include a lot of the additional costs in setting up the molecular laboratories, educating clinicians and patients on why they're getting a different test, and rolling out the program. Any changing program can be risky, but also expensive. And the final uh, suggestion is to take what you're using today, the conventional PAP, which is an a cost-effective screening tool, and combine it with automated imaging technology. This will certainly provide a solution to a lot of the, the, the challenges you face in the screening programs today, 
and I estimate that the cost would not actually increase. That automated imaging could be introduced to Malaysia in a cost-effective manner. Or it could even be less, depending on how you amortise the instrument cost, say over a 10-year period, uh, maybe up to 600,000 US dollars uh, saving per annum, or around 6.5 million US over 10 years. So this is something that maybe the screening program in the ministry may want to consider. Just a quick summary of the, the costs, as you can see, um, for the various options. Today's cost is estimated around $1.8 million. The conventional path with automated imaging would be, I believe, and I'm very confident in saying in front of the group here today, certainly no greater in cost, and maybe provide a cost reduction on what you spend today with improved performance directly reported out. Uh, and this provides significant benefits in accuracy, in turnaround time, and screening rates for the screener. Okay. And this is just a quick automated system would work. Countries such as we talked about before, New Zealand, Australia, the United Kingdom only this week has approved the use of the BD point imaging system into the screening program from November 1 this year. It is the only system approved in the UK at this time. It's also approved in the USA and it's the only system that is approved by the US FDA for both conventional and slides, but more importantly in 2008 it achieved the claim of the detection rate of cancer uh, and it's the only that has been proven in the US clinical trials to actually provide an increased detection level over manual screening alone. So just going over these opportunities for improvement one by one, how can the imager improve what you do today? Currently I heard earlier at some presentations on uh, yesterday or the day before, a typical screener may look at around 30 slides a day performing a full screen. This is Australia where probably the average is around 35 or 40 from laboratories and screening costs in Australia are a real concern for both laboratory but also the government. Uh, the BD focal point imaging system would enable you know, potential screening rates of around 150 per day per screener. Okay, five times the productivity. Okay, turn times could be reduced from what I believe today they're in the, the months to certainly, you know, like other successful screening programs such as New Zealand, seven days, the United Kingdom, which has a five-day working day reporting system. Okay, in the US, reporting levels are much faster. Their most successful programs report in days, and this tool will enable Malaysia to report in seven days, ten days, fourteen days, because of the productivity gain you get with the system. In terms of screening accuracy. The US FDA approved claims, uh, I won't go through all of these, but you can see up to 24.5% increase in cancer sensitivity, 19.6% for high grade, for high cell plus. Uh, we also have a paint directed QC function on the system which provides laboratories with a 7 reduction in false negatives for high grades. This is, you know, offers significant benefit to the screening quality and, and, and as the United Kingdom will use, the optional 25% no further review um, is something that they want to utilise from the system. Um, it's not utilised in New Zealand. New Zealand prefers to screen 100% of the slides. The United Kingdom from November will only screen 75% of the slides collected. 25% will be archived without human review based on the imaging data and, and, and measurement. There's been other studies uh, conducted on the imaging system, particularly as it relates to conventional smears. Uh, one of the presentations at the European Psychology Conference uh, a few years ago from Germany, over 100,000 samples by uh, Stephen Falk. Um, he, he outlines the cytotechnician screening time in Germany was reduced by 50%. Um, this is in line with other studies performed by you know, Tench, Wilbur, uh, Tony in, in, in Europe and the US. And the focal point GS is an tool to flag 
the few and small seal needles in the large haystacks, which was mentioned before. This is what this system is designed to do. Okay? And if you look at the data, you can see the number of low seal, high seal in the, the stratification of the imaging system is much greater. First quintile, the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. So the imaging system does detect extremely accurately high grades, low grades, and carcinoma. Cost effectiveness, if we take a, a potential cost per screener in a, in a country such as Malaysia, maybe up to 20,000 US dollars per annum. If this is the case, when they screen 30 slides per day, this is a cost of 8.8 .8 ringgit for manual review. The imaging system conservatively would allow for improvements to 100 per day, which would reduce the cost to 2.66 ringgit per slide, and 150 per day would be 1.77. USA and in other parts of the world, uh, the imaging systems are for 170 slides per day. In New Zealand, it's 140 slides per day. Okay. I know that, uh, like most countries, there's a shortage of qualified screeners and training and pathologists. And if you look at the 450,000 slides processed today, I think it was. Uh, Professor Mario, who, point, who correctly pointed out, this would, enact, would require about 55 cytotechnologists, quite a lot of tech laboratory uh, workforce, and, and this is really just for the, the, the full screen or primary screen. This doesn't include the pathologist time or rapid reviews. Um, these 450,000 slides, in the automated imager, would require about 13 cytotechs. Okay, or unlike laboratories in New Zealand, which to make redundancies due to automation uh, introduction, this system can grow with your increased participation levels in Malaysia. The same 55 cytotechs that do that screening today could actually screen with imaging almost 2 million slides per year. This would cover probably Malaysia's screening requirements for the next decade. Okay, training and program participation. Uh, just quickly on these areas, the, the focal point is used as a training tool in countries such as Australia and the US and, and, and there are certain programs we can provide on training as an organisation. Uh, potential cost savings from the introduction of automated imaging technology and, and the savings gained on labour, uh, ASCUS and colposcopy rates could be directed to increase awareness and education for ladies to get more participation into the program. Yeah, and, and certainly we've found in in some countries of Asia, but also in Australia, any laboratory that investors invest in advanced imaging technology actually creates some excitement in the screening program, the accuracy of the results provided, and, and, and women are, are well, uh, well known to be very familiar with breast cancer screening, with imaging technology, and other types of screening. So this provides cervical cancer imaging screening to ladies of Malaysia that's already in Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, and other parts of the world. Just a quick look at the review station. It's a fully automated system that uses a barcoding system for patient identification and results uh, and storage. It can be used by a foot pedal or a, or a mouse. The system allows for flexibility. For example, the imaging systems could be placed in multiple locations over Malaysia, say in KL, Penang, JB, KK, or just in KL as a centralised reference site for imaging. The review stations can be placed anywhere in Malaysia, in up to 50 or 100 cities, it doesn't matter. You can place the review microscopes of the screeners anywhere. They do not need to be in the imaging system and the, the system provides opportunity for a national patient screening database where the information is collected from the imager and directly stored into a computer system and a, and a central data bank. A snapshot of what the screener would see on our slide wizard or GS system. There's a lot of uh, imaging facts that I won't go into due to time, but as I said, one imaging system can screen about 100,000 slides, 170 approved in the USA. Um, it sorts and ranks the slides on abnormality and the risks of abnormality. And in conclusion, I think it does enable us a realistic and cost-effective solution to some of the issues you have today 
Certainly our experience in working with ministries such as South Africa, where they invested in seven imaging systems three years ago, predominantly due to the same problems. And then BD as an organisation worked with the local screening department and implemented the imaging technology to automate all of the South Af African screening. I'd like to say thank you very much to the organisers, to our partner laboratories which are, are growing uh, in Malaysia, and our local PD uh, Women's Health and Cancer team. Um, I think we're the only organisation in women's health that has a, a local team for the short path product um, supporting laboratories uh, in this country. So thank you very much.